And here we are, live talk with Becky Chernick, F&I Trends. And boy, I have got a great show in store for you guys tonight with Tom Klein. And I'm really excited about this conversation. But before we get started, for those that are new to this channel, I'm Becky Chernick. And I've been providing the very best in finance and insurance training for automotive dealers, as well as independent recreational dealers throughout the USA. And sometimes you guys can find me in Canada and that's all, all always a lot of fun as well. Um, so this is being broadcasted live here on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. And by the way, Facebook fans, Ev and I today with Becky Chernick, you definitely got to sign up for the Ev and I today with Becky Chernick in Facebook. And thank you so much guys that are in Ev and I today with Becky Chernick is, I'll tell you, I really appreciate all your support. And thank you again, Facebook fans for all that happy birthday wishes, man. You guys are awesome. Cool. I love that. So thank you very much for that as well. And then we're also being broadcast over there on YouTube. And if you like, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. And wouldn't you please share. So here we are, Tom Klein, welcome. And Again, it's a pleasure to have you here with Live Talk with Becky Chernick tonight. Always, always great to be with you, Becky. Thanks for having me. Well, it's certainly a pleasure. Okay, so let's really get down into it. So, you know, I'm really excited about talking about, you know, so many things that are happening in our industry and especially with FTC. Now, it's more on FTC and everybody's going, well, it used to be the CFPB and now it's the FTC, and they're coming down hard on some of these car dealers. So um, I want you to talk about, there's a big group, and I'll let you kind of talk through this for us, if you don't mind, that just sure. got hit, or they settled, let's put it this way, for $3.3 .3 million. Now, maybe for some $3.3 .3 is not that big of a deal. I don't know. Um, the cost of doing business sometimes, I don't know, is getting higher, right? And it may not right. necessarily be something that dealers have bargained for. Um, I think we do have a hello here. Uh, let's just see who we've got going on. I've got a Facebook user. Thank you again for being on. Larry Feldman. Hi, Larry. Hey. <laughs> we love Larry Good Feldman. Larry. <laughs> And then, of course, Larry, my buddy. Hey, I'm glad you're here on tonight with us as well. So, um, and then we've got Michael, Michael Dean. Hey, Mike. Good. I'm glad you're able to be here tonight. Okay. So, talk to us about what's going on with this major group. How did they get in trouble and why? Okay. So, the FTC has been this year increasing their enforcement activity. We saw a $10 million fine back in the late spring to Napleton Automotive. We've seen an increase in the attorneys general who uh, are fining dealers. Uh, specifically, there's a dealer uh, up in Massachusetts, Maura Healy, who used to be the attorney general there, who was just elected as governor today or yesterday, whenever that was, yesterday. Um, and so you've seen a tremendous uh, uptick in enforcement activity, Becky, and part of that enforcement activity has been the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I think it's important to touch on the Federal Trade Commission and, and, and their um, enforcement actions. And in particular today, I'm going to be referring to this 18 page document, which I've posted on, on uh, LinkedIn for anybody who's interested. Uh, well, before, we, can, can I ask you to do me, do us a favor, sure. um, Tom Klein, not everyone knows you. I know you, uh, I'm really good with what you do and how you do it. And I, I, I think you're amazing. And I think what I really love about you is your background. The fact that you've been a dealer, you've been there, you own it. And, um, I mean, so you're wise to a lot of stuff, right. And, right. uh, Right. And, yeah. and so, and then your background, you know, what you do and, 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 and how you help dealers. So, sure. would you so my, my family's been in the car business since 1925. Wow. So we're coming up on almost a hundred years. So that's like what 40% of the, of the uh, age of the country is, is the clients have been in the car business. So uh, I was a dealership owner for 30 years 
and we sold our stores in 2019 and that's when I started my consulting business. And my consulting business focuses on, you'll see after my name, it says GRC Consulting and GRC stands for Governance, Risk and Compliance. And those three components work together to try to minimize problems, try to ameliorate them when they come up. And if there are big problems, making sure that there is a way to transfer the risk. One obvious technique of risk transference is insurance companies. So having insurance policies that will back you up. Um, using the Graham Leach Bliley Act, you know, do you have cyber insurance if you have a, a a breach and of course you know the ftc the new regulations are uh, dealers are supposed to be compliant by december the 9th and that's a <laughs> whole nother that's a whole nother show that we, yeah. we can have on the graham leach bliley act but um if you had a data breach would how would your insurance respond do you have a plan so all those kind of what if questions uh and they all happen uh, and I've seen them happen because there's a lot of what if that happens over 30 years. Uh, and I guess I'm on my 32nd or 33rd year in the business. So um, this is what I do to help dealers is try to prevent problems before they happen. And if they do have a problem, have a way or a methodology or a way to keep the amount of money of the problem to an absolute minimum. So that's that's where I focus my time and effort. And I think it is important. I think a lot of times, you know, especially when all this started coming up, I start, I asked, are dealers really taking this stuff seriously? Right. I mean, are they right. blowing it off and let's just call it what it is. And, um, they're like, you know, Beck, we have bigger, we have other things to do. We have bigger fish to fry. We don't need to be messing around with FTC and all this other stuff and these, whatever it is, because, you know, every single time we get, you know, we go there, you know, we find out it's, there's another way around it. And maybe, and then we'll talk a little bit through some of these other uh, platform providers that hopefully mitigate some of that risk. But again, are they really doing the dealer favor? So, right, right. when it comes to right. that. Well, I mean, I talk to dealer principals all the time, and it doesn't matter whether you're one store or 30 stores. One of the first questions I ask is, do you have a compliance clerk at each of your stores? And if the answer is no, then I know they don't have a very robust compliance program because someone to have a robust program, someone has to go back and check behind all the policies and make sure everybody's following them. Just having a policy isn't enough. And so you have to have mechanisms and checks and balances to make sure that you're doing those audits and, um, and, and, and documenting and making sure that uh, you're following all the things that you should be following. Well, I think that that is, is, is important. And I think sometimes dealers don't see the, um, importance and, and, or I, there's this saying in the industry, the cost of doing business. And right. I think some of that cost of doing business is going up a skyrocketing <laughs> and it's not something that I don't know. Um, I, I, I would, I mean, it could it could be millions. It can be a felony. It can mean losing your dealership and in in your franchise over it. It just is. It it it's just important that dealers are paying attention. So okay. Sure. So, so let me let me just tell you a quick story because so, you touched on a dealership losing its franchise. Yes. This is a true story. Um, I I uh, know a dealer who was engaging in some not fabulous advertising practices. And that's one of the things that you need to look at to make sure it's going right. Uh, upset a customer. Customer went to a politician. Politician went to a motor vehicle dealer board. Motor vehicle dealer board proceeded against the dealer. And the over a series of months and months and months, they went to court and with that administrative hearing, the dealer board came back and wanted to suspend the dealership for seven days because of these advertising violations, which is a violation of their franchise agreement. So they could have lost their franchise as a result of upsetting one customer. So millions and millions and millions of dollars because they didn't take care of, of this one particular customer. So. 
with that, we can go back to the other. The other. <laughs> okay. So it was a big group. And um, so what happened? So the FTC just um, presented this consent order um, against Passport Automotive Group. Now, I don't know Passport Automotive. I don't know the owners, Mr. Helmuth or Jay Klein. I don't know them. So anything that I'm telling, talking about tonight is, is strictly based on my reading of what the FTC and their attorneys have agreed to. So uh, because on the last page of this, um, not only their attorney had to agree to it, but they also had to sign for this personally. So uh, and that was done on September the 19th. So, uh, so the FTC took what's called a permanent injunction against Passport and all of their dealerships. And um, that injunction includes a lot of the following. So the main complaint was that the defendants participated in, in deceptive and unfair practices in violation, uh, mostly of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, but also Reg B which is advertising. So the two biggest problems were um, in the advertising sales and financing of motor vehicles. And the allegations are also of discrimination, um, which is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. So right. I'll pause there because I know you'll, I know you have questions or you'll make keep going. Well, okay. So like, first of all, well, I think for, for, for those that are watching and hearing in um, or listening in later too, um, but what does deceptive trade practices actually, what does that mean? What do so, you know? How do you prove that? Right. What is that whole thing about? So it falls under what's called the UDAP statutes. UDAP stands for unfair, deceptive, abusive acts and practices, U-D-A-A-P. And the UDAP statutes are out there to protect customers. So anything that is in any way deceptive, essentially, to boil it all down, anything that would be deceptive to a customer will come under the UDAP statutes. And in this well, how case, how do they prove that? Well, in this case, they didn't apparently have to prove it because they agreed to it. So whatever, so whatever the FTC had, whatever the evidence that they had, it was enough that the dealer um agreed to it and signed for it and and agreed to a fine of 3.380 million so it's three million three hundred eighty thousand i don't want you to miss the three hundred eighty thousand i think yeah it's that 380 is not that big of a deal that's just you know that's a vacation um <laughs> a rounding, a rounding error yeah um okay so we've got this they agree to um this okay um deceptive practice in that they weren't properly disclosing terms do i have that well or they were so, charging customers more than what they should uh for products or for rate how does that work i think it was both based on my my reading of the consent order so there's a large section under the definitions called clearly and conspicuously now, clear and conspicuous is a standard for advertising. Uh, according to the FTC, your advertising terms must be clear and conspicuous, which, and to use their definition, means that a required disclosure is difficult to miss, i.e. easily noticeable and easily understandable by ordinary customers, including all the following ways. So a tel in a television advertisement, the disclosure must be presented simultaneously in both the visual and audible portions of the communication. So in other words, if you have a disclaimer that says um, payments are, you know, $5.59 a month at 73 months at whatever, in, in you know, all the terms, it has to be disclosed simultaneously, so both audibly and visually. That's supposed to, they're supposed to both be on the screen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read something yeah. uh, from a guest. 
um, attending. Likely the insurance company handled the issue and paid the claim. Dealer may not have a say. Insurance company has the ability to mitigate damages. And that, and Steve, you could be right. They may have turned it over to their insurance company, uh, but the insurance company will not cover any allegations of fraud. And we also don't know whether they had higher limits on their insurance. If they had higher limits, you absolutely could be right. Uh, if they didn't, they didn't. Um, um, in in your comment about the the dealer can't stop the payout in some circumstances, you can argue with the insurance company over what they're going to do. But but if you argue with them, the insurance company is going to say, "I'm not going to pay out anything." So you do risk that, assuming they had coverage. Some of these things, we don't know whether they had coverage. For example, on ECOA coverage, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, discrimination to a, a third party is not always a covered peril. And some policies have that coverage and some don't. Um, and so you have to be very careful and, and look at your garage package to make sure that your garage package does have third party discrimination coverage. Usually, even if you do have third party discrimination coverage, it's done as a sub limit and not with the full um, the full umbrella coverage. So, again, we don't know and we're speculating, but uh, it's a good it's a good question that you ask. So what was really interesting about this is that, you know, I'm in dealerships, right? Like I'm, I, I get in there <laughs> and all the time. And, and like, I see what's going on as far as, you know, charging an interest rate or, you know, uh, marking an interest rate up, right. And, or a product. And, you know, I've tried to tell dealers until, I mean, until I, I don't know, for the past 20 years, we've talked about it a million times about consistent product pricing and pick, pick, pick whatever that retail price is. You can always back down off of that, but it's your starting point. And you not you need to be consistent about it, but yet I can't get a dealer to pay attention to that. Or right. for example, we have dealers who will charge whatever they want to for a service contract. They do it all the time. I'm I'm not trying to be getting I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble here. I'm just calling it the way it is. They do it all the time. And especially if a lender allows you to charge more uh, for a particular service contract, right? In their in their financing they're going to go ahead and they're going to charge more because they can make more right. and, that's and they're on commission and they're on commission. And you guys, you know, we're on commission. So I don't know an F good F and I person really who doesn't work a pay plan. Um, sure. Right. Everybody, everybody on the planet earth works their pay plan. Let's be you would think right. you would think some people tell me otherwise, but we know, I think that that's the whole idea. I mean, dealers want an F and I person work this pay plan. I set this up for you to work it. Um, right. but okay. So to, so, so, so to your point, to prevent problems there, there, and again, this is a risk question, right? Yes. If the dealer's willing to take the risk, then they risk this. That's what they risk. Um, but it starts with a consistent first pencil, right? You have a matrix that says, if you're this beacon score, this is how much the interest rate is. And if you're this beacon score and always there's a consistent first pencil. So that's the, that's the first way that you ensure that you're not discriminating. The second way, and I'm, I'm just giving this to you in real brief bullets. We can talk about any of them. Sure, sure. The second way, is, as you mentioned, is, is um, consistent pricing on your aftermarket products. And the third is to have a policy about how much markup. Now, since Passport did not have, apparently have a policy, then the FTC and Passport have now agreed, and it's in, it's in this document, and I'm gonna find it so I can read it specifically for you, but it's in this document that from now on, they are only able to mark up 100 basis points, and that's it. So they are now capped for, and I, I don't remember whether it's five years or 20 years. 20 years. I read it. Um, I thought so, it was. so section D, at each defendant's dealership on an annual basis, they have to choose 
uh, to charge the same amount of basis points not to exceed 100 above the buy rate on all non subvented retail installment sales contracts. Ouch. And that's, and that's what they get. And that's that. Oh, that's on top of everything else because that's, that's that, that, right? But that's all, but that's all they get. In other words, they've agreed that, to it. Yeah. They get a hundred, they get a hundred basis points mm -hmm. and that's all. Yeah. Well, so, that's costing them some, right? Um, it's costing them a lot. Yeah. That's um, what I'm thinking. <laughs> it's costing them a lot. As I, I wrote, I might've mentioned this to you before. I wrote an article that said, let the government be your customer service department. And if you're not taking care of your customer problems, the government is going to become your customer service department and they're going to tell you how much you can charge. So why do you think, I think is if FTC coming down more on, on, on these, um, on deceptive practices and advertising, where, where's FTC, um, where are they headed? And, you know, it, at a time, Tom, you know, it was the CFPB. It was just like dealers were going, oh, the CFPB is going to, you know, we have to. And now all of a sudden the CFPB didn't have as much teeth anymore. And so that's kind of fallen off. But now it's like, now we got the FTC, which there's a lot more teeth in the, in that. Can you ex kind of ex go there a, a bit and explain? Well, the new, I think it's the, I think it's the atmosphere. Um, the new, there, uh, the FTC came out with new advertising regulations for dealers and, uh, that happened for, they asked for public comment and that public comment ended in September and, uh, NADA after uh, the 90 days were up in September, the NADA toward the end asked for additional time to make comments. And the FTC voted five to zero not to give any additional time. The FTC had voted on those regulations four to one because there's five commissioners. They had voted four to one to pass the regulations. And their rationale is that they have so many customer complaints that, uh, uh, that they feel it's necessary to standardize all the website advertising. And that's what the, new proposed regulations that these are not in effect yet by the way and and some dealers are confused about this they are confusing the graham leach bliley regulations which go into effect this december 9th and these new proposed regulations which were proposed there was a, t a period of comment uh, and then they go back and they take the comments and then they decide what they're going to do and in my opinion, they're going to pass those new regulations, the new advertising regulations. So I think this might be um, the FTC regulating the auto industry because we're not self-regulating enough and we don't have enough uh, governance, risk and compliance policies in place to make sure that we are taking care of customer problems uh, and being upfront with the business practices. Well, I think that I think let's just say this and i'm going to be i'm going to be somewhat careful minded how i go about it but i would say since the pandemic we've kind of gotten a bit loose and um and some of our skill a lot of our skill set our processes have eroded and nobody's checking in right we've got right. this and um, we're going strong and just leave well enough alone back. You know, that's, you know, we got this. And meanwhile, maybe they don't got as much as they think that they have. And, and then, I mean, if you go into a store and that process from the desking, from the, just the desking alone, um, a consistent pencil, that's not happening. Where is that happening? Right. I mean, it's not, I mean, it isn't. Okay. And then from, from the time that, and should, you know, there's conversation about pre-qual, pre-qualifying, uh, pre you've got uh, CarMax pre-qualifying, which I think is a great idea, by the way. I think it certainly takes a lot of the heat out of it and friction um, and gets that customer in the right vehicle the first time out. Um, but, and then AutoNation too, you know, they got another pre-qualified, just text uh, this number and you get, um, right. you know, a, a number, um, what you likely would it be approved for. So I think that's cool, but 
what are dealers doing to put these steps in place to assure that their desking is, 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 is compliant, <laughs> let alone from the time that that deal satis it, it comes together. What are we doing there to, to make sure that we have a paper trail in place that the customer certainly, as you mentioned earlier, agree to the terms of the sale. What does that mean? Is it an e-lead worksheet that's not completed all the way? And you know how these e-lead worksheets are, right? Um, you show down payment, but you don't have down payment. I don't know. And, <laughs> you know, so something makes its way into the F&I office and F&I managers are still there to figure things out. And here's the other thing. What happened to the bill of sale? You know, when I was growing up in the car business, we had a bill of sale. Customer agreed to the terms of the sale. They signed right. a bill of sale. Do you understand a buyer's agreement? Right. Buyer's order. Right. Do you remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there should be. There it's should not. Be. Well, in the case, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. In the case of Napleton, the way that the FTC um, wrote their press release was very interesting because you could kind of read between the lines and see that they did not have a buyer's order that matched the retail installment sales contract, which matched a menu. And if they had had those three documents that matched, then I think the FTC would have had a hard time saying that the customers didn't understand what they were buying. Because in the Napleton case, one of the, the allegations was that uh, the customers didn't understand what it was that they were getting and that Napleton was adding products or adding other junk fees or whatever it was. If you've got those three documents that match, though, boy, that's a hard argument to, to make because you say, well, here's the document where they signed the, the, you know, the buyer's order and here's the retail installment sales contract and here's the menu and they agreed to all three and the numbers all match. And then you kind of shrug your shoulders and say, now you tell me what's going on here, Mr. Regulator. Well, exactly. So the way that, you know, for years, I mean, I, tr I would train. Customer understood the sale, understood what they were paying for a car. We agreed to those terms. Right. And dealers, some weren't crazy about that idea, but it was like, well, first of all, shouldn't the sales department be responsible to close the customer on the price of the vehicle? Isn't that 101? I mean, isn't that their responsibility? Since when is it my response or F and I responsibility to go ahead and close on price and payment? Well, you know, the customer didn't go ahead and yeah, had no issue with regard to payment. I'm like, bet me there's customer. Right. You show them a 24 months. I bet they care about their payment. Right. <laughs> Hell no. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So it was like, okay, so where is that bill of sale? Just get me there. Have a customer agree to the price of the vehicle. Then from there into the FNI office, into a menu presentation, understand the terms of the sale. We, it matches, like you say, then from there, if something's sold, then you have the bill of sale with the product sold itemized. That's another thing. Itemized. Right. Some of these buyers right. agreements do not itemize anything. So one of the things I found out aftermarket product, Finance contract, where does it generally go? Where is it sometimes, where does it go? In line mm -hmm. one, which isn't sometimes itemized on a finance contract. Oh, right, because there's there's hard ads there sometimes, there's products there sometimes, it's, it, sometimes it just doesn't match. So when you don't have itemization of the finance chart or the financing, what does that mean? We're in violation of what? TILA, truth right. and lending. Right, and Reg C, that's exactly, TILA, right. right, truth and lending. Right. And I don't know. Yeah. So that's not happening. I'm, glad right I passed. Now. I'm sorry. I said, I'm glad I passed. Yeah, you did. You, you asked the passed. question. I'm glad I passed. Yeah. Yeah. You, you do. Um, I, I just didn't under, uh, I, I went to make sure I was understanding it correctly. So we have, uh, Steve. Um, yeah, he's already said that. And, uh, hi, Rebecca, Domingo, Domingo. I hope, hopefully I said that right. Um, but okay. So that in of itself is getting dealers into trouble. So if in the event they were to have that paper trail in place, what you're saying though, it would, it would 
pretty much get them off the hook. It's it's a it's a good affirmative defense, right? If the truth and especially the truth, the retail installment sales contract, if each and again, this is a very simple thing to check, right? If you bought Gap and it's six hundred dollars, Gap should be listed on the retail installment sales contract for six hundred dollars. It should be listed right there. It should also be on the menu for six hundred dollars. Um, this is this is not tough. well. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna stop you right there, and it's not. Deal, dealers do not put product pricing on the menu. They they should. They They're should. not it's doing it. They're not it's doing a, it. It's a mistake not to. And and it, it's and, and, actually and, on the, the maybe disclosure payment. of the and, menu. And the payment too. Oh, right. Sure. So a menu. So let's talk about a structure of a menu. This sure. is not what we came on to talk about. But we I know. I'm sorry. It. That's okay. It's good. So a menu. At the, somewhere on the menu, it should have the price of the car without any products. The customer should initial that. So the, is the payment like got to be right? Yes, the payment has to be right. You there can't pad be, it? You can't, you can't have more than, I would say, this is all subjective, but I'd say $10. You can have, you can have a spread of $10, but no more. Um, but on the menu, on the menu... You should know the payment at that point without, without the spread. The, the, right, the spread. You you can get the spread up front in the first pencil. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, By the time okay, you get to yeah. the menu, it should have the, the payment. There's okay. there's no there's no there's no spread on a menu. It's the payment. Hi, Brooke. <laughs> Glad you could join us. Um, um, so there's so on the menu, it should have the price of the vehicle without any products in it, the customer should initial that. So you can say the customer understood that anything that they bought was optional. And then, in the way I like to see menus, they should be two pages. The first page is the menu presentation where you're showing you have all these products and here they all are and you can buy any of them a la carte. I don't, I personally don't like the presentation of the silver gold platinum package where they pick one because that's that in of itself into my opinion is a little deceptive because if the customer wants one from column a and one from column c and there's no package put together like that then you're not showing it that way so my opinion is that page one of a menu and some people don't like two page menus by the way because they take more time but they really don't. So on the menu, it should have all the all the things that they can buy and then they can choose. And then on page two, you have accepted and declined items. And that's what they sign. Good menus also have a timestamp at the bottom of page one and page two so that you can see whether the F, if the F&I manager, if there's one minute between the timestamps, you know he didn't do a product presentation. You can tell because it's stamped. There's no way to get around it. Unless it's a recontract, in which case I get it because on a recontract, you've already been through it and the customer already knows what they want and all you have to do is get the paperwork straight. That's a different story. But on a, nor on a normal deal, it takes at least five to seven minutes to do a product presentation. So on a, on, on a menu program that I like, page will you check the timestamp at the bottom and look that, that there should be a, a lag between page one and page two. So that's my opinion on what there should be for a proper and a, a, a proper and legal menu disclosure. Well, what's interesting is especially now uh, with digital menu, because we have a lot of digital menu going on and you have dealers that are showing the first pencil, if you will, the first part of the menu online. Mm -hmm. And um, that first menu that you and I are both used to is gone. Right. It doesn't exist anymore. It well, is a on, digital on side. Digital. digital. Um, I don't um, know whether or not. It, it, there is an actual um, footprint um, where 
a digital save on the front on that first pencil. I don't, I don't know. I, every digital menu is different than the other. Um, I believe that some save some of that. Um, and then of course, then they finalize and they, they will print out the declination as you're, as you're talking about, um, and have that in the deal jacket. Right. But I'm wondering, okay, well, if you have a situation, is that first menu with the base payment, it, where is it? Um, I don't know. And then of course you have the, uh, declination page, um, disclosure page. But my question is, and many, many of these menus are doing it where, um, the, that payment should change based off the products that the customer purchased, which matches the finance contract. Right. They should all match. It should match. <laughs> this is not, this is not tough stuff, but it, but, but no, when nobody is checking, the finance managers aren't going to do it. Yep. Um, and it's really that simple. And so, by the way, and it's also important to know that we were talking about the Equal Credit Opportunity Act when we were talking about Passport. And it's important if you don't present all products to all people, then that's another potential ECOA violation. Because if you didn't present GAP to the purple customers that you have, then you're really discriminating against the purple customers because you didn't show them that you have gap insurance. So it's also, it not only is it a, it, it's a, it, it's important all the way around. It touches so many different laws and rules and regulations. Um, well, you know, when you talk about the purple, let's pretend it's subprime. Right. Um, you know, I love purple, but I'm just saying, let's just say it's subprime. Okay. And I can tell you, you know, from my perspective, when I'm working with F and I people, I can tell you how many times Becky cannot go ahead and sell them any, any product, or there's only one product, maybe gap or service contract, the rest they can't take advantage of because I can't include them into financing. And I'm like, I hear what you're saying, but so you have to still that. off there. Go ahead. You have to you have to offer it to them, and maybe they borrow the money. Maybe they put it on a credit card. Maybe a lot of different things can happen, but you still have to offer it to them with the additional monies down. You can certainly take advantage of this with the additional monies down. I've had it before where I customer um, was had a line five, and I said, "Hey, total loss protection here." I'm telling you right now, you def they were flipped. Um, but she ended up coming out of pocket for the difference. So I could at least make sure she had total loss protection included right. in financing. So it can sure. happen. It does happen. And Absolutely. so in this passport thing, basically what they were saying was a lot of inconsistencies across the board. Correct. Both in advertising, it appears both in advertising and in um, in violations of ACOA, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. So, uh, so they got hit for junk fees. What exactly is a junk fee? A, a, a junk fee is a, um, for a product or something that is deceptive. Nitrogen in the tires, for example. I mean, it, we should get beyond that as a as a group, right? I mean, as an industry. Um, cell catalytic converter insurance, you know, theft insurance or something, something that's real, but there's no benefit to nitrogen in the tires. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's about as good as blinker fluid. Um, in my I don't opinion. know. I mean, I've had, I've had some of these guys tell me, Oh, Becky, but that, that is, there's a huge value in that. I'm like, it is, I don't know enough about it. I don't it. understand if it, it, I'd be, I'm happy to be wrong. If, I, and if I'm wrong, somebody can call me later and explain to me the nitrogen in the tire thing. Cause I don't get it. I I'm happy to be wrong. Maybe I don't understand. I don't I'm know it that much. I'm happy to be wrong. Um, but that is like a junk fee, like something that's being sold that really doesn't have any value. Correct. And where is that? Is that added to the front end on the addendum sticker? How does that work? Oh, it can be it can be stuffed into the sales price. It could be added in F and I. I mean, there's no there's no uh, there's no limit to where you can add in junk fees. 
So um, it's not added as an addendum on the on on the car. It could be. It could be addendum on the car. I mean, I've seen it all different ways. I've seen I've seen it added as an addendum. Um, I've seen it added in F and I. I've seen. How it, do they add it in F and I? Is it just like here it is? Um, oh, by the just, way. <laughs> it, well, they just they if they're not doing a menu, it's easy to put it in there, right? Well, that's true too. I, when you're cool. talking packing, great. Right. I mean, that, that's a, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly how it works. So if there's no, uh, if they're not doing a menu, they can put it where they want. Guys saying on line five, I was trying to hit the lender on option specific, like gap at specific price, high percentage close from the lender and the consumer gap. You know, it's interesting because the military, I live in a military town in Norfolk, Virginia. And the military for a while was saying that they didn't want their sailors to buy Gap. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very interesting because a lot of the plaintiff lawyers who sue car dealers were like, we don't get it because we like Gap. Like the plaintiff lawyers even like Gap. So I've never understood why anyone would have a problem with Gap as a product. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, even I can tell you that even the plaintiff lawyers like Gap, that's saying something. Um, well, I thought that that was a little unfair, especially when that whole was going on for the longest time. It was over a year or two years. Than, I think it was longer it, than that. Yeah. And uh, like, I don't know where they got this idea that it was a uh, Gap, uh, total loss was a bad thing for you. But um, anyway, so yeah, Steve, uh, it's something. Steve here has a long comment. Yeah, I'll get there. I'm okay. going to finish you know, that thought, and then we're going to go, um, I got it. But um, anyway, so yeah, I think that that total loss protection, there's a lot of value in that, in that product for sure. And to call the lender back anytime you can to see if they'll include it only makes sense. In absolutely. this case, we weren't able to do that, but that's, that's a, that's absolutely um, a must. Right. Okay. There's your, there's your, there's your comment from Steve in Ooh. Chicago. I still see the line system used and literally written on the deal jacket to make sure the box knows the profit. Okay. So oh, sure. I just remember a line on trades. I did this because it was mandated in a large group and I was at between, okay, 2003 and eight. Now they are owned by Auto Canada. The line system intentionally was designed to prevent customers from knowing and to share it with F&I. It was F&I pack. But today it would appear they are front loading it in many cases. So I'm assuming there is some sort of a, um, a line indicator that, you know how you remember back in the day, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but we used to, the when we got a trade and we had like five, they'll have like five, they'll have five lines. I don't know if this is anywhere what this means, but we had the extra five in the trade, right? And so we'd have lines indicating how many hundreds was available that we could play with. I'm not, I'm not sure remember. that's what Steve is saying or not, Steve. I don't know your, either. Take um, your comment and uh, clarify that for us if you would. Yeah, um, Steve, could you go ahead and tell us, uh, uh, clarify this? And I, it, it was mandating a large, and I, now they are owned by, and the line system intentionally was designed to prevent customers from knowing and to share it with F and I. I don't know. I imagine it's some sort of F and I pack of some sort. Probably. Uh, Mike, you're talking about selling yeah. air. Okay. Yeah. Mike is saying you're talking about selling air, convenience fee, dock fee, processing fee. Yeah. So let me let me take your question from the end and work backwards. Most states have a fee that you can charge. Some call it a processing fee, some call it a dock fee. And whatever the state law that you're in, whatever the state that you're in has, um, has a law surrounding that. And it, that's fine because you're allowed to sell that by law. And it's usually codified in that state law. But when you get into other kinds of fees, and I've seen environmental fees and, and uh, you know, just things that are not necessarily uh, real and you couldn't tie those numbers in somehow, 
but you just have an extra, it's pre-printed on the buyer's order and it's $99 or whatever it might be. Uh, those kinds of fees are what I'm talking about. They're problematic. They're problematic not only from a state perspective, but from a federal perspective. So if you're charging fees, you better be able to justify that they're real and that you came about them mathematically somehow and that you're able to charge them um, in, in your state and that it doesn't violate any federal laws. So fees are very complicated. Um, and th this is not, PAC, we're not talking about PACs. PACs have customers don't understand PACs. They don't see them, they don't feel them and it doesn't make any difference to them. So we're, we're specifically not talking about that. I hope that answers your question. So, um, yeah, so let me ask you this. Um, I often wondered, dealers have some of these platform providers, um, compliance platform providers mm -hmm. that they have, um, uh, there's their team, sales team, finance team, um, become certified in certain areas um, where they need to be certified and, and trained on certain compliance. Mm -hmm. Does that, is that enough to get the dealer off the hook on with regard to any kind of incident, like what you're talking about, what happened with Passport or even Napleton? Yeah, I don't think so. So I think it's a start, but you know, GRC or governance risk and compliance is part of part of a robust program is making sure you're checking behind. So it's not enough that you just have the education. Education helps. It's you should have education on your education. You should also have employee sign offs. Because if the employees aren't signing off documentation that they understand, they read the policy, that kind of thing. When someone comes in and says, well, how do I know you trained them and you can't show them that the employee signed something, that's a problem. Um, so a, a good example, Becky, is I go into dealers, one of the first things I ask was, is let me see your IRS 8300 um, a policy and then your forms and how many you've sold. And they say, oh, we got, I, everybody, every deal says, we got, we're good on that. And I can tell if they're good with one question to the cashier. If you go up to the cashier and you say, I have, a, it's actually a one question with multi parts, but you say, okay, if I bring you a cashier's check, how do you receipt that in? And she says, oh, it goes under here under check. Okay. If I go in, bring you a traveler's check, how does that go in? Well, that goes right here under check. If I give you a personal check, how does that get received in? Oh, that goes under check. Well, you know that that's then garbage in, garbage out, right? There's no way that anybody's checking what these checks are, whether they're, they're considered cash by the IRS. And I know they have a problem. And so we have to rebuild their 8300 program from the ground up because that's problematic. And as you know, uh, you can be fined, I think it's 5.5 million, up to 5.5 million, and five years of jail time for willful noncompliance in the IRS 8300. So, it, it, but if you, don't, if you don't go back and look at these policies and make sure that you're doing them right, then you really don't have a robust compliance program. You have some written documents and that's all fine, but they're going to look at them and they're going to say, well, it's nice that you have these written documents, but how do we, how are you enforcing them or are you enforcing them? And how do you know that your employees are doing what they're supposed to? Well, you know, I think, I, I think you're so right. Um, when you say that we talk about that, it's just, I know I have these policy and procedures in place and I'm like, I hear you. And you know, when I go into a dealership, I'm, I, I'm not as, you know, I'm not into the risk um, management as much as you are. You get into the nitty gritty, you get into the contracts, you get into all that. That's what I love so much about you, Tom. Every time I have a question, I'm calling Tom up, <laughs> but I, I'll do a review. I'll do a light review. And sure. I'm like, okay, so this is your expectation. This is what you're thinking is happening. And as I go through and audit the transactions, what do we find? And we find it out a lot. Every time you think it is, it's not happening. 
right? And sure. that's what gets us into trouble because we believe it's happening, but who's inspecting what you expect? That's and it. that's what you see all the time. You see it happening all the time. And this is what gets these dealers into trouble. So right. here's another question for you. Chris Walsh, thank you for coming on tonight, Chris. This guy, he's supposed to be retired. I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. No, <laughs> he is. He's in Florida having a freaking pina colada. Um, <laughs> he, and he, he makes the best Bloody Marys. I don't know. Um, but 1999, me to my sales manager, did you leave me a leg? <laughs> and then sales managers, there's enough in there for you to sell them a second car. God, I miss the old days. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chris Walsh. Um, no, he knows it. He's He's been involved in this. And the reality of it is, I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to say in a lot of stores, there's a lot of leg going into a lot of these FNI offices. That's right. It just is. Now Absolutely. with things tightening up, there shouldn't be the rate right is here. going up. The pricing of these vehicles at a all time high, the customer can only afford so much you would think. And it's like, ah, you know, I don't know if I have all that room that like I used to, uh, to be sending into that F and I department and how many dealers, you know, are going to certainly get hit, um, you know, when it, when it's all said and done. So it's time to roll up those sleeves and get, get, get back to some of that skill set. So guy says this, you have the burden of proof for perceived value AGs and FTC CFPB love this play. I think what guy, I think, I think what guy's talking about is the problem going back to our conversation about products. If there's no perceived value, nit nitrogen in the tires and okay, you know, that I, that's, and nobody's yet come on and said, you're wrong about nitrogen tires. So, um, but I'm waiting for those calls, bring those calls if I'm wrong about nitrogen tires, but no, you have to, if there's no value in what you're selling, then they're going to, be upset with you when you say, well, you know, this is what I'm selling and this is what I'm charging for it. That's going to, because it's deceptive and the customers are being taken advantage of. So the, the products you sell, uh, make sure that they have value. Uh, if you have, if you're selling etch on the windows, it better be a registered product and, and something that really might de deter a theft as opposed to just putting numbers on a window and, and, uh, and, and hoping and praying that nobody ever checks behind it. Well, it's the product, but the product pricing, the product pricing that you're consistent with everyone. So I remember going back to Chris, Chris Walsh days. No, not my days, but when I, in some of these stores I've been in with these theft protection and, you know, some of these stores would charge like two grand. I'm like, you can't charge two grand for that protection. What are you talking about? So my question is how often, well, you know, you can't take away my profit, Becky. Um, that's, that's not cool. That's, you know, why we're in business. And I'm like, I get you, but how often are you selling that, that protection at $2,000? How often is that happening? This not is, a lot. This is a risk question, right? If the dealer, it's his risk tolerance, and this is, this is why risk mitigation is a thing. If the dealer says, I don't care, I'm willing to take the risk, I'm willing to write the check for $3.380 million in case I get caught, that's up to him. It's his business. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell ever tell a dealer that they're, that they're wrong. What I'm gonna say is if you decide you're gonna have these business practices, here are the potential risks. And here's what you potentially get fined for. And here's what you potentially have uh, plaintiff lawyers nipping at your heels. And here's how you're going to get sued and, and that kind of thing. And, Christmas and a is lot coming of, up. Huh? I say Christmas is coming up. Right. <laughs> nipping at your heels. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it used, to, it used to be many years ago that it was easier to settle a lawsuit come December because people needed Christmas money. That was just a thing. I don't know if that's still a thing, but... A lot of lawsuits get resolved in December. Um, and that's not, that's, that's the truth. Yeah, um, yeah. So if you've got pending lawsuits out there and you need help settling them, call me and I'll help you with that too. But um, 
it's 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 up to the dealer to decide whether they want to install these policies and procedures. And if not, they know they run the risk of having a problem. But the ones who have, uh, you know, <clears throat> I was at a, uh, an accounting 20 group where uh, accountants get together who do books of car dealers and they have a 20 group just like car dealers do. And I said, what's the average value of a, of a store now? And they, I said, is it 20, 25 million? They said, no, it's higher than that now. It's probably in the 30, 30 millions. So when a dealer puts his feet on the floor in the morning and knows he's got $30 million at risk, right, with the inventory and the building and the blue sky and all the things that go into it, that's his $30 million at risk. So it's up to him to decide what he's interested in risking, what he's not. And that's where the whole practice of risk mitigation comes in and deciding here's what the, here are the potential problems and have at it. Right. So, right. Okay. So I kind of like that. So, okay. Well, I, here's and, the thing. Here's what, if in the event you way, get caught, if you get in trouble, th this is the potential risk that you face. And that's so. It. And I have dealers say, I'd ra I've had a dealer say to me recently, I'd rather write the check. Okay. You now have the burden of proof of proceed. Well, I think we already did that one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you know, I, I'm with, I'm, I'm okay with that. As long as, you know, you, 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 they, they, you know, as long as we sign off that, Hey, right. Oh, by the way, I shared this information with you. You made the decision to do whatever that you, you, you want to do. And sometimes you have that dealer out there who says, you know what, this is what we're going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to charge whatever I want to for whatever product I want. I can get away with. That's what I'm going to do. Right. I'm like, okay, well, you had that conversation. So that is your decision, right? Right. And, th and they're not my client. They're generally not my clients because they don't need me, right? If they say I'd rather write checks to the to the government, then they certainly aren't going to use me. Yeah. But, well, you you would you would hope, right? Or maybe yeah. not. I don't know. Or you know, if they're if they're utilizing your talent and yet they I can tell you how many times I mean, dealers have paid me and not necessarily agree uh, you know, with what true. I've I've it's shared and I'm like, okay, at least I know I shared yeah. this and you're the one who's got your, you know what, out there, not me. It's so. their money. Yeah. It's their money. So, so it's their decision. No, on judgment this, on, no judgment from me. So on this FTC proposed ruling coming up, which is different than the FTC safeguard ruling, because there's two things happening. FTC safeguard ruling, Graham Leach, Bliley Act update versus the proposed ruling uh, FTC, do you really feel like, and I, I had a, um, there was an article that came out in Automotive News and with regard to this poll, that a lot of dealers are finding it that they're ready for this proposed ruling. And I'm going, I don't see that happening. I think maybe it's a higher level thinking, but what's really happening in the trenches it's it, there's a lot of work going to have to come ha, have to come together to really implement those those best practices. You, are you talking about on the proposed new advertising regulations? You're talking about the Graham Leach Bliley. I'm talking about the new proposed uh, um, advertising rules for for next year for 2023. Yeah. And disclosures. Yeah. The, you know, there's nothing to do at the moment other than wait for the FTC to make its ruling. Uh, their final ruling, of which I think they will pass it because the original passed four to one. Uh, and so I don't see them backing off of that. Um, I understand from inside sources that that's not going to make the trade groups happy and they're going to do something about it. But, you know, I don't know that ultimately they can do anything about it or whether it'll be decided in uh, in court. And uh, And I think Ultimately, the adjudicator, whoever that is, will say that the FTC is there to regulate. And that's part of the, I think, the part of, the, I'm not a lawyer, as you know, but it's part of the FTC Act that they are there to regulate. And I think ultimately those advertising regulations will go into effect. I think similar to the Graham Leach Bliley, I think they'll give everybody a year or something to come into compliance and they'll set the bogey and that'll be that. 
Cool. Well, there we go. You know, I'll tell you, we can get done in an hour. It, it, it just felt like we just got started and yep. always feels that way with you. And yep. Tom, thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone and your feedback in here uh, tonight. And again, for the FNI today uh, with Becky Chernick Group on Facebook, thank you for being on and being there and saying hi. And then, of course, LinkedIn Live as well as on YouTube. Thank you again, Tom and everyone. It is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And